Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. morning. I am excited to introduce to you uh, Halima Nash. Halima and I were in grad school together, uh, and we had, uh, I I don't exaggerate when I say I couldn't have made it through grad school without her, from helping me uh, fit in, to helping me move, to just being like a sister and a family member in a place that felt like I felt lost, um, which I think you like adopted me, like the sad little puppy that was walking around lost. But I'm grateful for her friendship. Um, You might be able to check out her biography. She is an, an incredible person. She doesn't uh, just inspire me. She inspires literally a a nation with all that she has done. Uh, Currently, she is the chief partnership officer of the Academy Group and has done incredible things, whether it be working in social impact for uh, major league teams like the Chicago Bulls or working with uh, youth with iMentor. She has done all kinds of things, and she's also just a phenomenal human. Uh, and so if I always joke that she has like a direct line to the divine because if I'm having the worst day, out of the blue, I'll get a text that just says, hey, I love you. That's it. That's all it says. So I don't know if that's good or bad or if you want to talk to her and ask God something she knows, um, but it is wonderful to have her uh, in our presence and in our midst. And she's also my mom's favorite child. So I joke around, but I went home at Christmas once and there was a photo of Halima on her iPad. Not me, just Halima. So that tells you a lot. Um, I joke, but she is a gift. And so I, I want to pray for her and, and, and just invite her forward. So Halima, if you'll come forward, I'd love to pray for you as you lead us. God, we are grateful for friendships that you give us along the way and when we get to share them. God, now I simply ask that the words of Halima's mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered in this room together would be acceptable because, God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Mic check, one, two, one, two. Can you all hear me? All right, there it is. Well, good morning, people of God. I'm going to put this down here so that I can spend a little time with you all. Would you mind that? Okay, fantastic. Um, I am so grateful for the opportunity to be before you today. Um, As Sarah mentioned, she is my sister. Um, And beyond being able to know each other in our graduate school studies and beyond having the opportunity to share a friendship, I have learned so much from her um, in her pastoral work, in her work in servant leadership to people. Um, So my sister, my peer mentor, um, that's the homie. So thank you, Sarah Heath, so much. Uh, You have been a gift to my life. So to get an invitation, a second invitation in her ministry work uh, to address the congregations that she serves feels like a tremendous honor. Um, And it is a double honor to have Mama Heath here. on the front row, a woman who I love so dearly and I don't get to see very much. There are years that are in between our opportunity to see one another, but you are a light and you are a woman who represents triumph in a million ways. So thank you for your testimony and how you've shared that with me. So let's dig into the word, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, and everything in between. Um, So you heard the scripture being read, Matthew 16, 13 to 19, 21 to 23. Um, And I am just going to call out a few parts of this scripture for our purposes today. Um, Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, others the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you. Blessed are you. Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, You are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. So today I would like to journey with you with the backdrop, the inclusive church, lessons from the biblical character Simon Peter, and today's diverse picture of discipleship, Kendrick Lamar. (laughs) So Simon Peter was wild. I 
absolutely relate to Simon Peter. Like, he reminds me a lot of the friends that I hang out with. He is a person that is a believer. He wasn't necessarily dependable the way uh, that, you know, we profile what a Christian leader is supposed to look like. Without God's spirit, he often spoke or acted in a way that would be considered inappropriate. That's definitely me. Um, Simon was not the likely profile of someone who you would choose to stand in your pulpit. Hello. (laughs) He was, for our purposes, a man on the margins of society. When Peter saw Jesus walking on water, he said, Lord, if it's really you, if you are really about this whole life, command me to come to you on the water. Like, he tested Jesus out. He pulled a knife out on a high priest and cut off his ear. In a tense situation, I just might cut you. (laughs) He was outspoken. When Jesus asked his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Peter immediately and emphatically stated, you are the Christ, son of the living God. And even later on, Simon Peter denies Jesus. And the Bible says in Matthew 26 that he began to curse and swear, dropped a couple F-bombs, relapsing to the habits of his earlier life. And actually, we see the story of Simon Peter and his denial of Jesus in all four of the Gospels, which is a beautiful reassurance of God's unconditional forgiveness, even in the face of the worst sins. But if we are not careful, we will see Simon Peter through the lens of deficit-based thinking. Because Simon Peter's story was powerful, and we see in the scripture that he was chosen I talk to young people that I serve all the time about the dangers of deficit-based thinking. I remind them to be strengths-based in how they see themselves and also how they see others. So when people tell you that you're low income or you come from a low income community, you always say, I'm from the most resilient communities. When people question you about your sexuality and say that you should sit in the back of the church, or you are a person that is living in sin, so you should be separate. You say, this is the life that I live out love. So we have to be careful to ensure that we are not deficit-based in how we think about Scripture and how we think about the people that God chooses. So this story is a joining of both confession and community, where Peter makes this great profession of faith, and Jesus responds with the revelation of how he will build his church a truly inclusive church. This paints the picture. Who do we say that Jesus is? And how is that internalized in our faith? And how do we live that out in community? So today we're gonna talk about the lessons we can learn from Simon Peter in the Bible and Kendrick Lamar in today's culture. And the importance of confession and community and destroying bias in creating the inclusive and Christ's intended church. So here's the scene. At this moment in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus and his closest disciples are taking a brief break, and they're staying in the city of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus actually asked two different but powerful questions. Who do people say that I am? And second, who do you think that I am? And answering the first questions, the disciples report that people are saying that he's either a reincarnation of John the Baptist or one of the great Hebrew prophets. It's like if I were to ask, Pastor Heath, what do people say about me? And what are the biases that come automatically when you might talk about me? As a black woman, I battle these in every single space that I'm in specifically in predominantly white spaces. There are biases that people walk in with automatically. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. Ethnic name, black women are really dominant. I wonder if she's gonna be domineering in this meeting or conversation. They entertain well, maybe she speaks real good. They're strong, sometimes they're angry. They talk with their hands. On the other side, you might read my bio and you might say, she went to Howard University, she must be really, really smart. Or she went to Duke, she must be a Duke fan. I am not, I am a Tar Heel fan, go Heels today in the tournament. (laughs) There are biases that you might have and assumptions that you might have about people. 
It's also in an uncovering in this scripture of where biases begin. How has your flesh been informed? What has the world written on your perspective? Who do people say that I am? And then ask, Jesus asked a second question. Who do you say that I am? What about you? What would you say about the Christ that you serve? Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is a question that pastors ask in pulpits all around the country and all over the world. Who do you say that Christ is? And how do you respond out of your faith to that question? When your flesh isn't clouded, but informed by the power of God, who do you say with your confession and how you live that statement in the world that Christ is? So here Jesus sees in Simon Peter the signature attribute that will define him from this point forward, and that is his faith. And it's only through faith that he could know Jesus as the Christ. It is only through faith that we can truly see people and even see Christ through bias. The result of that faith is that our choices become communicative of the creative power of God. Because if you even see me through your faith, you see me as a child of God and not a strong black woman, not a person from the hood, not a person that is significantly different than you are. You see me in my humanity. As a black woman, yes. In my strength, yes. But you see me as a child of God. And we cannot come to the full understanding and acceptance of the true nature of Christ or even Christ's presence in others just through our flesh. Because our flesh empowers us to lean on our biases. We might know in our minds that you are human and you are human and as are you, but we have to have faith in that knowledge. We then become a part of the consciousness and community that Jesus describes as the kingdom of heaven. So the word in Greek translated here as church describes a group of people sharing an awakened spiritual consciousness. What it's not is the segregated, regimented, structural religion that we often identify as church. Sunday is the most segregated day in the week because when we go to our churches, most of the time, our churches look exactly like us. They are not necessarily this tapestry of diversity that our workplaces might be or our schools might be or the places that we shop might be. They are segregated spaces where we gravitate to people that are like us. We are tribal in nature. We look for like-minded people. And sometimes we look for people that look like us, people that come from our same context. But this is not the church that Jesus is speaking about. If that were the case, we would come to know Christ and even have an understanding of spiritual truth through religion or through a set of rules or a warped way that our fallen humanity has informed the word community. No, Jesus came to replace the structure and the top-down way of thinking with a heart-centered, faith-based understanding of who he is. So Jesus said, I'm going to give the kings the keys to the kingdom to Peter. Peter that pulled a knife on a priest. <laughs> That's who gets the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And then the metaphor changes from rock foundation, like I'm going to build my church on this rock, to I am going to give the keys to the kingdom to a person that also has the power to admit or exclude people. So the person who is often excluded becomes the decision maker on inclusion. Ain't that just how Jesus works? The LGBTQ person who is discriminated against in a company becomes the director of human resources. <laughs> the black male who was targeted by racial profiling and police brutality becomes the chief of police training. The teen who was suspended from school for unruly behavior is appointed the head of the school disciplinary committee. 
Who would have expected Simon to become one of the world's greatest teachers on love, hope, humility, and respect for and submission to authority based on what we know about him? Would Simon Peter be excluded in our traditional setting? The cursing Simon Peter, the knife-wielding Simon Peter, the Simon Peter that would give even Jesus a stern talking to, as we see in verse 22 and 23. As a church, we have to use this as a guiding question. Who do we say that Jesus is? And how do we, just as Jesus did, see the deep authenticity that exists in the diversity of those whom he chooses to reflect his deepest truth. Diversity matters to God. This is anchored in scriptures throughout the Holy Bible, and I believe that it is time for the church to reclaim its leadership in embracing those who are at the margins so that we can live as a mosaic and not a monotone canvas. The scripture compels the church to be inclusive. In almost every chapter of the New Testament, you'll find God telling his people that we are to love one another. The gospel is intended to bring people together, not separate them apart. So my favorite artist is Kendrick Lamar. I'm from Compton. He's a Comptonite. Brilliant, brilliant poet and lyricist. He grew up as I did, a teen on the margins. He went to a school district that under formed in test standards, graduation and retention, but he was a high achieving student. He grew up surrounded by the blood gang, as I did, and witnessed shooting in his neighborhood and had to navigate safety and dodging drug activity. And he turned to his life, his love for poetry, into street poetry that popular culture has embraced as West Coast reality rap. And in his myths tapes, he often speaks to his faith journey hoping to combat how he is often named, hoping to change the narrative. As opposed to a gangster rapper or a thug or a violent man, he is a Christ-centered poet that even in his mixtape gives an altar call in one of his songs. In the song I, he writes, I done been through a whole lot, trials, tribulations, but I know God. Satan want to put me in a bow tie, praying that the holy water don't go dry. And in all right, he says, I'll write till I'm right with God. That's a word. (laughs) But we don't often see scriptural teaching in spaces like West Coast gangster rap. We often don't see leadership and power and transformational love on a hip hop album cover. It's hard for us to do that. It's hard for us to see through the biases that we think about who these artists are and who these people are. But there's a really powerful song that actually reminds me of this passage that we're talking about today. It's a song called How Much a Dollar Costs. When Kendrick encounters a drunk homeless man asking for change. So he denies the man, look, I'm not, I'm not about to give you change. And then he doubles down on his stinginess, but he learns that this homeless beggar is much more than meets the eye. He writes that the man who is coming to him is quoting scripture and is speaking God's truth. The homeless man says, know the truth, it'll set you free. You're looking at the Messiah, the son of Jehovah. And later on in the song, he says, and I'll tell you how much a dollar costs, the price of having a spot in heaven, embrace your loss, I am God. Kendrick is narrating an experience of being humbled by an encounter with God's word spoken from a homeless drunk. His bias and his general knowledge of the word of God that Jesus might come in many forms didn't come to him immediately. His bias did. And even Kendrick himself is not someone who we would see as a disciple or a Christian who can reveal God's truth. But for me, Kendrick Lamar is the very essence of that, the same way that Simon Peter was. And in spite of Simon wilding out, cutting people, (laughs) in spite of his unpolished nature, Jesus prophetically named him for what by God's grace he would become. Jesus did not allow any level of bias to prohibit his blessing. And I will say that again, 
Jesus did not allow any level of bias to prohibit his blessing. If you are deficit based in how you think of Simon Peter, you will miss the beauty of this passage as an arrow that points to the power of an inclusive church. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. Cephas is a word that means stone in Aramaic. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He blessed him as he was with all his frailties, all of his imperfections, and the knowledge of even his future mistakes and ways of being different than the West, and spoke life into the future for who he would be. With all of Simon Peter's flaws, he is an example of the kind of faith that allows for community as Christ intended. A community with differences, wide-ranging journeys, palettes, Wild and tame, outspoken and introverted. Sexual orientations, race, gender, new Christian, or born speaking in tongues. We are one humanity under Christ. But we need God to break down with his spirit all of the destructive ways that our flesh allows us to be segregated and to not be inclusive. And all of the ways that our flesh hinders us from not only just having the knowledge but having a belief that lives out in our churches and lives out in the way that we love one another. Jesus said, on this rock, on this rock, on this experience, on this marginalized journey, I will build my church. Will you lay down at the altar your deepest bias? Will you lay down your internalized and even lived out racism if it lives in you? Will you lay at the altar the walls you've built for people who do not fit the profile of who you think belongs and who should lead? Or are you willing to live your life not being able to see truly the light of Christ? Because flesh and blood or general knowledge cannot give you this blessed spiritual perspective of inclusivity. It is only given by our Father in heaven. Allow him to change your name, that we might not just be church on Sunday, but that we might be the church that exists beyond the world and beyond these walls, and that we might truly be an inclusive church. Let us pray. Gracious God in heaven, we do thank you for this Sunday. We do thank you for your words being spoken to us. We pray that it might penetrate the walls that we build up in our spirits, the walls that we build up in our employment spaces, the walls that we build up in our schools and in our community. Make us a true community. Give us the eyes of Christ that we might see one another. Give us the faith of Simon Peter that we might see you and say that you are the Christ, that you are the Son of God, and let that be so powerful that it would penetrate through our speech and our decisions and the way that we love in this world. I pray that you bless us in this place, Lord God, and that you destroy everything that is unlike you. Make us one human community. For your name's sake we pray. Amen.